Kia ora, my name is Jesse and I'm so excited to talk to you today about what is the Bible. That might seem like a silly question for some people. We all have a preconceived idea about what the Bible is. But today, we're going to learn that the Bible is an amazing library that ultimately leads us to Jesus. All right, what is the Bible? Depending on who you are will depend on the answer you give to that question. If you're a Christian, then you probably believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Um, perhaps you heard the phrase growing up that it is basic instructions before leaving earth. I think many of us as Christians also kind of think of the Bible as a way that we can get to heaven while avoiding hell. As long as we do the things in the Bible, then we're good and we're good with God. But perhaps you're not a Christian. Perhaps you think that the Bible is a collection of fairy tales like Aesop's fables or any other story of fairies. And as well, if you aren't a Christian and you don't think of the Bible as favorably, perhaps you think of it just as a set of outdated, antiquated stories about people who really didn't know any better. Perhaps you think of the Bible as a tool used by powerful people to get what they want. Here's the uncomfortable truth, and this is probably more uncomfortable for you if you're a Christian than if you're not. The Bible has been used by many people over many generations to justify all sorts of horrible things, from oppression towards women, minorities, slavery, and much, much more. But on the other hand, the Bible has also been used as an incredible tool and a source of hope, inspiration, and love for many people, from Martin Luther King Jr. to Mother Teresa. So how is it then that the Bible can be used by people to justify horrible things like slavery, but also be used by men like William Wilberforce and Abraham Lincoln as the very antithesis to that idea of oppression. No matter who you are, whether you're a Christian or not, here's something that we can probably all agree on, that the Bible is perhaps one of the most misunderstood and misused holy texts in history. So perhaps the problem isn't the Bible itself. Perhaps the problem is how we read and interpret it. And so today, we're going to answer that simple yet not so simple question, what is the Bible really? What does the Bible actually think it is if the Bible could speak to us today? And I can think of no better place to start with that question than right at the beginning. We're going to read from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, you probably don't need me to tell you what it is, but I'm going to read it anyway. Let's read together Genesis 1, verse 1 and verse 2. Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, from the NIV. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The way the Hebrew is translated in these two verses is fascinating. First, we have the sky, the air, or the heavens, as it is translated here. The Hebrew word for that is Samayim. The next part is the land, the ground, the earth, and that's Eres. And then finally, we have a third sort of character, a, a, an object, a thing, a concept, and that is the deep, dark, primordial waters that God comes in and hovers over. This is the Tehom, the deep, primordial, chaotic waters. Right from the start, we get a clue in the opening passages of Genesis as to what this book is all about. In fact, the opening words give us the clue. The opening words are, of course, in the beginning. Now, pop quiz. What kind of book opens up with the phrase, in the beginning? A code of law, an encyclopedia, uh, a textbook? No, a story, a narrative. From the very beginning of Genesis, the biblical writers are wanting to tell us that we are entering into a story. Now, 
If you've read the Bible, you know that there aren't just stories in the Bible. There are many, many different types of literature. And you might think, well, wouldn't it be a little bit reductionistic to just say the story is a story? Well, you're right. The Bible is made up of many different types of literature, but here is the paradox of the Bible. The Bible is a story told through many different forms. And today we are going to explore some of those forms and they're going to tell us exactly what kind of story the Bible is telling. When we open the Bible, what do we see? The very first thing we see is the waters, the sky and the land. And we see the Spirit of God hovering over the earth. And God doesn't just come in and hover over and do nothing. He starts something going. And we're going to read about that as we continue in this passage. So read with me Genesis 1 and we're going to go to verse 9. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And we go on. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Now, if you've ever read this passage before, as many of us did growing up in church, it might seem fairly mundane to you. You know the story. God creates a bunch of stuff and there are some repetitions. But I want us to take notice of some of those repetitions. So I'm going to read a little bit more and I want you to envision what are the repetitions that are going on in this passage. Those repetitions are going to tell us a little bit about what this story is all about. Let's continue reading. Verse 14, and then God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Did you spot any of the repetitions in this passage? There were some before and they keep repeating themselves. It starts with the repetition of God declaring, I am going to make this thing. And he speaks and it is so. And then there's a repetition of God looking at all the things that he's made and he says, you know what, this is good. And then finally, at the end of every day, there is evening and there is morning and we transition to the next creation period. So what is the author of Genesis trying to communicate here? Well, the first thing that he's trying to communicate is the power in speech. God speaks something into existence and it comes into existence. There is no scientific explanation for how the plants and the animals came into be. What the author is trying to communicate here is the raw, divine, creative power that God has. And this is just a small selection of some of the repetitions that we can find in Genesis. And I want to throw out a somewhat controversial thought, at least it might be controversial for some people. Genesis, it's really tempting for us to read this book as just a dry sort of scientific account of how God created the world, but it's actually more than that. Genesis is poetry. And that might be surprising for some of us to learn that Genesis is poetry, but these repetitions prove that Genesis really is written as poetry. It's written to be, uh, to, to be, to be spoken, to be, um, to be shared with a community of people and for us to have it deep in our hearts because after all, that's what poetry is. It's something that we can store with us. It's something that can go into our hearts that we can remember. And that isn't the only 
example of poetic repetition that we find in the Bible. In fact, as we talk about what the Bible is, let's jump to another part of the Bible that riffs on this same story. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? And you know what? I'm going to read a little bit more. Verse 5 and 6. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Did you catch that little riff? When I consider the works of your heavens, the things that you have created, the land and the seas and the animals and everything in it, what is the author of this psalm riffing on? It's creation. This is a poetic reflection of the Genesis 1 account. The author of this psalm is saying, Lord, Lord, how majestic is your name because of all the things that you have created. And I also want us to notice what he says at the very end of this passage here. He doesn't just praise God because of all the things that he's made. He also says, wow, you have given us glory and honor. You have crowned us. That's not something that we often hear. Did you know that you are crowned with glory and honor? Because creation doesn't just stop with the animals and the land and the seas and the fish and everything in it. Creation is inaugurated and finished with the creation of man and woman. And then what do we do? We rest. So in this passage, the psalmist is saying, Lord, how majestic is your name? Look at everything that you have created. You are worthy to be praised. And it's all in poetic form. Then he finishes by saying, and what's even more amazing is you have crowned human beings with glory and honor. You've created us to be your divine God, human partners to rule and to reign alongside you. That is mind blowing. But the Psalms and Genesis aren't the only places we see these poetic creation riffs. In fact, I want us to go all the way to the New Testament to the letter to the Colossians, where we see this very same idea in effect. Turn with me to Colossians chapter one. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Now, it may surprise you to know that this passage was also a song. It was kind of like a psalm. It was sung by the early Christians. It was called the hymn to the Christ, the Messiah song, the Messiah hymn. And it was sort of like a creed. It was sort of like a, a, a poem that they would sing together to remind them of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Christians would gather early in the morning and they would sing this song, among many others, to remind themselves of who they were and who Jesus was in the midst of their daily lives. Now, there are 27 books in the New Testament. And of those 27, 21 are letters. And of those books, many of them are written by one man, the Apostle Paul. And letters are a really, really interesting type of literature that we see in the New Testament. Often they're kind of like one-way mail. If you imagine you're listening to a friend and they're talking on the phone and you're trying to figure out what the conversation is, you can only hear your friend's voice. And so that's sort of what letters are like sometimes. We see the correspondence from Paul or Peter or John to a church or a person, but a lot of the time we don't see what happens in return. We don't see the response. And so we have to try and piece together what these letters actually mean. But they're not impossible to decipher and they're actually really, really interesting and really helpful for us as Christians today. 
many of these early letters are some of the closest examples we see of Christianity being worked out in real time. Many of the things that we believe today as Christians are a direct result of the theology that was being worked out in the letters. The letters are also really helpful because they give us an insight into what it was like to be a Christian in the first century. We see some of the struggles, we see the joys, we see some of the controversies that were happening in the church in the first century, and we see the theologies and the spiritual uh, practice that was developed out of these occasions. The letters are also really fascinating and powerful because for us, they kind of feel like the closest thing to being a Christian in the world that we live in. When we want to know what it's like to be a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, as a Christian, we often turn to the letters. When we want to know what we should do in worship or how we should act and behave as, as church, as new creation, we turn to the letters. The letters are also the ways that we can interpret a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we see in the biographies, the, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We see these early church fathers and mothers working out what it looks like to be Jesus followers in real time. But as much as the letters are warm and comforting, sort of like a familiar blanket or a, a good friend, there are parts of scripture that are difficult not that easy to interpret and a little bit confusing. In fact, it might surprise you that along with poetry, along with letter writing, the Bible also contains a book of satire. Now, that might be a really strange thing to say, but I want us to turn to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is a tiny little book. It's only four chapters long. And I don't know about you, but growing up as a Christian, I only really associated Jonah with animated vegetables and children's stories. But when I grew a little bit older, I began to see some things in Jonah that I hadn't seen before. Let's first consider who Jonah was. Now, we don't know a lot about him, but we do know one thing, that he was a prophet living during a really uh, prosperous time in Israelite history. We only have one other reference in the Old Testament to the prophet Jonah. Apart from that, we know almost nothing about him, apart from the fact that he was the son of a guy named Amittai. Jonah begins with a fairly self-explanatory um, statement. Let's read together Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Not exactly the most heroic opening for the prophet Jonah, right? He is a proud Israelite, and yet... We see in the beginning that Jonah does almost exactly what a prophet should not do. There is no dialogue, there is no conversation, there's not even an argument. Jonah just gets up and he leaves. After directly hearing from God about, you have to go to Nineveh and you have to go and deliver this word to these people who need it. Now, many of the prophets in the Old Testament had a reputation for being controversial. Many of them had really unpopular messages they had to communicate to the Israelite nation, to Judah, or to neighboring countries. And this is seemingly more the same, an unpopular message, certainly a message that's going to be unpopular to any Ninevite who hears it. And yet Jonah, unlike any of the other suffering prophets who go through hardship to deliver the message of God, he just says, you know what? I don't want to, and you can't make me. And so he gets up and leaves. Now, the interesting thing about Jonah is throughout the entire story, we are introduced to characters that seemingly contrast and throw light on the character of Jonah. Throughout the entire story, we are supposed to believe that Jonah is the one who is going to hear the word from God, um, is going to be transformed by it, and is going to communicate it in a humble way to the people of Nineveh. But just the opposite happens. So Jonah's on his ship and he's headed towards Tarshish amongst a whole bunch of people who have no idea what's going on in his story. And a great storm kicks up. 
and everybody is absolutely terrified. Apparently, it's the most terrifying storm that they've ever seen in their entire lives. They throw cargo overboard, they pray to their various gods, and eventually they cast lots to determine whose fault it is. And Jonah eventually steps up and says, you know what, guys, it's my fault. I ran away from God, and now this is happening. You know what you should do? You should throw me overboard because that's going to fix the problem. Notice what the characters, these supposedly heathen sailors do instead. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Let's read it. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Did you catch the progression in these characters' stories? Jonah is the man of God. He is the prophet. If anything, he should be the one who cries out to God, who offers a sacrifice, who repents of what he's done. And yet these heathens, these people who we presume are not Jews, they are the ones who say, Lord, forgive us. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. They offer vows and they sacrifice to God. They are, in the Jewish mind, doing what is appropriate when faced with a situation like this. Not Jonah. It seems like he is getting outshined by these characters, and yet he is the man of God. Let's fast forward to chapter 3, and we see Jonah entering the city of Nineveh. He gets swallowed by a fish, and I'm not trying to gloss over this because it's perhaps the part of the story that we all most think of, but it's easy to get stuck on the fish part. Let's go to the part where he actually gets to Nineveh. Chapter 3, let's, let's move over there. And I want to read to you what Jonah does and what the people respond with. Jonah 3, starting in verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So, just like the sailors before them, the Ninevites respond to God with humility, with devotion. They act like people who are truly repentant, people who have identified what they've done wrong and decided, you know what, I want to make things right. And you would think at this point that there would be a celebration. They all lived happily ever after. Jonah lived to a ripe old age, satisfied that he had done what God had asked of him. But no, sadly, Jonah's response is anger, frustration. He leaves the city, still hoping that God is going to rain fire and brimstone down upon them. And when he doesn't, he is absolutely incensed. He is so angry. He is so bitter about the whole thing that he basically sits out there waiting to die. And Jonah ends in a really awkward way. God and Jonah have this conversation right at the very end about God and his willingness to forgive people, even people who are terrible. And let's not forget, the Ninevites were a terrible people. If you know anything about ancient history, you know that it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire at this time, and it was a, a horrible, barbaric, disgusting empire by modern standards. And Jonah has good reason not to like them. They represent everything oppressive, everything evil about the world in his time. And yet God is willing to forgive them. And we don't see a resolution to the story. In fact, all we see is Jonah and God having this final last conversation. And God ends with the question, of the people who have, who have lived in this city, why should I not have mercy on them? Why should I not have mercy on whoever I like? And the story just ends. 
Jonah is in many ways supposed to be taken satirically. We are supposed to believe that Jonah, the prophet of God, he is stepping into the role of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, these prophets who declare these really unpopular um, messages and who suffer for it. But they suffer willingly, knowing that they are speaking the word of God. Jonah really does not do this. He drags his feet. He tries to run away. And every time things go seemingly his way, he has a way of messing it up. He's not the best example of a prophet. In fact, he's probably one of the worst prophets we see in the entire Bible. And this story, I think more than anything, is supposed to make you and I, the audience, think. Because when God says this last statement, why should I not take mercy on these people? He's not really talking to Jonah. He's talking to you and me. Because Jonah is really trying to make us question God's mercy, God's justice. It, it, it's trying to make us think, well, just because I don't like certain people doesn't mean that God doesn't. Just because I believe certain people aren't worthy of compassion, of forgiveness, doesn't mean God believes the same thing. And Jonah, more than anything, is supposed to make us enlarge our idea of what God's mercy and compassion looks like. And I think we're also supposed to laugh at Jonah a little bit because he is a ridiculous person. Studying the Bible truly is the work of a lifetime. There's no way that you or I would ever be able to plumb its depths and get everything out of it that is there in just a few years or even a few decades. This thing, this amazing piece of literature requires you and I to be devoted to study, to, to invest ourselves in it over the course of a lifetime. And as we do that, as we continue to study it, as we continue to allow its wisdom and its love and its grace to seep into our souls, I believe that we will find that the Bible is a single story that leads us to one place, and that one place is Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I thank you for the diversity and the unity that we find in Scripture. We thank you that there is so much here that we can learn, that we can be blessed with, and Father, help us as we study your word. Please speak to us, reveal new insights to us. And most of all, help us to catch a fresh revelation of Jesus through the study of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.